guys so now we shall be discussing some of the important topics in abdomen and pelvis so the first picture which you can see over here this in here we'll discuss different kinds of planes okay so first of all uh, this is just a general discussion that what is transpyloric plane which is also called as Edison's plane so if you are uh, uh, drawing an imaginary line present between L1 and L2 right so this becomes your transpyloric pain and there are many structures that are uh, located within this transpyloric pain we shall discuss that in a minute next important thing is that you see this is the coastal marge you see there are two u-shaped structures here on either side this is the coastal margin actually just beneath the coastal margin which means between l2 and l3 this particular plane is called as a subcoastal plane so first of all what you do is you locate the subcoastal plane just above one vertebral level above the subcoastal plane will be your transpyloric plane Next, where is your umbilicus located? Exactly, it is located between L3 and L4. Okay, your umbilicus is located between L3 and L4. Next, the lower border of L4 or, you know, these two are called as iliac bones. And here we have got uh, tubercles, iliac tubercles. If you are touching the two tubercles and drawing the line that goes between L4 and L5, and that is called as transtubercular plane or tubercle of iliac crest. Okay, transtubercular plane or tubercle of iliac crest. If I ask you which is the highest point of iliac crest, that would be your L4. L4 is the highest point of iliac crest. So these are some of the important things which you need to know. And remember one thing, how many planes? Transpyloric, subcoastal, transtubercular plane. Okay. Next important thing is that within this transpyloric plane, what are the structures that are present in the transpyloric plane? For example, pylorus of the stomach is present. Pylorus of the stomach is present. And from where does superior mesenteric artery originate? It originates from the transpyloric plane. And where is the hilum of the kidneys present? That is also present in the transpyloric plane. And finally, the fundus of the gallbladder is also present in the transpyloric plane. So this is something, the memory part which you need to remember. The next important muscle which we will be discussing right now is rectus abdominis, which is also called as a flexor of the trunk. So if you look at this muscle, let us see from where does this muscle originate, okay? You see here, this muscle originates at this particular location and this is called as your, what is this? Pubic symphysis as well as pubic crest. So it originates from pubic symphysis and pubic crest. Originates from pubic symphysis and pubic crest. Now where does it insert here? Basically, if you see, if you zoom in the picture and see, it is inserting to the sternum exactly which part of the sternum the tip of the sternum that is your xiphoid process and not only that it inserts to xiphoid process and not only that it is even inserting to you see the ribs over from here till here right so these are all the way from five fifth to seventh ribs and it is also inserting all the way from fifth to seventh ribs okay so that is the insertion point next this muscle is having some white colored straps in between this white color straps is nothing but called as your tendinous insertion, is a tendinous intersection. Okay, so this white color straps over here are called as your tendinous intersection. Now, based on this muscle, we shall actually have to discuss about the inguinal ligament. We shall discuss uh, about the inguinal ligament in detail. But before we start discussing the inguinal ligament, what we do is that we first discuss another important topic that is what are the branches of the abdominal iota. Then we'll switch on to the inguinal ligament. Okay. First of all, let us write down the central branches. Central branches in the sense, the branches which are located in the center. For example, see this is one, right? This is branch number two. And after that, you have got branch number three. How many central branches are there? We have got three central branches. So always remember the branch which is located over here. This is called as your celiac trunk. This is called as your celiac trunk. Okay. Next important thing, the branch which is located over here, right? So this particular branch over here, this is called as superior mesenteric artery. So when there is superior mesenteric artery, we even will have the inferior mesenteric artery. I M A inferior mesenteric artery. We have got superior mesenteric artery. We have got inferior mesenteric artery. Now let us see the branches that are present uh, peripherally, right? So you can see this particular branch, this is on the left side called as left phrenic artery. This is called as left phrenic artery. 
Next, beneath the left phrenic artery, this one is called as left superior suprarenal artery. What is this? Left superior suprarenal artery. Next, from the celiac trunk, you have got the branches. Remember one thing, celiac trunk supplies to the liver. I will rub it away, but just for uh, understanding purpose, I am writing it. Liver, right? It will also give a branch to the spleen. It will also give a branch to the stomach. Okay. So, for example, if uh, this is a branch that is given to the stomach, right? So, you have to call it as left gastric artery. Below that, what is a branch? Below that, that is a branch that is given to the spleen. So, you call it as splenic artery. On the right side here, what is this artery? Th what is this particular branch that is dividing into further more branches? This is called common hepatic artery. Common hepatic artery is divided into this is called as this common hepatic artery. Now within this common hepatic artery, these two branches here, we have got one is called as a right gastric artery and gastroduodenal artery. Okay. So let me rub this out. Right. So celiac trunk branches, what did I tell you? One branch to your stomach, right? So that is called as left gastric artery. So this is called as left gastric artery. Okay. And next we have got the down. This one is called as a splenic artery. This is called as a splenic artery. And on the right side, we have got this particular artery. This is called as a common hepatic artery. So common hepatic artery is divided into, see this branch over here is called as right gastric artery. Actually, right gastric artery, rather than arising from the common hepatic artery, it arises from hepatic artery proper. Next, this one is uh, the artery that is present between the stomach as well as the duodenum called as gastroduodenal artery, GDA, which stands for gastroduodenal artery. Next two important arteries here, we have got middle suprarenal artery. So one we have got is the left side superior suprarenal, right? And this particular artery over here is also on the left, but this is called middle suprarenal artery. Middle suprarenal artery. Next, down here you have got another artery. This is left inferior suprarenal artery. Left inferior suprarenal artery and what are these two larger arteries that are emerging on either sides one is called as a right renal artery and this is called as a left renal artery right renal artery as well as a left renal artery okay and next important thing you see this is artery number one two three and four how many arteries are there four arteries all these four arteries together they constitute left lumbar artery left lumbar artery okay so all of them constitute the left lumbar artery and so these are some of the arteries over here and one more artery you have to not forget that this particular artery over here is called as a right testicular or the ovarian artery right testicular or the ovarian artery okay so these are some of the very important arteries which you need to know out of which, out of which, the celiac trunk, right, the superior mesenteric artery, inferior mesenteric artery, these are the central branches over here, right. Now, if you look at the topography, where is exactly the celiac trunk present? The celiac trunk is located at the lower border of T12. It is located at the lower border of T12. Superior mesenteric artery is located at the lower border of L1. And inferior mesenteric artery is located in the body of L3. What? It is in the located in the body of the L3. Next important thing. If you look at this particular picture over here, this is your celiac trunk and let us discuss the branches of celiac trunk. So what are the branches I told you? One branch to the stomach, one branch to the spleen, one branch to the liver. So you see a branch, you see a branch that is passing, that is emerging from the celiac trunk. You see that is coming from the celiac trunk and it is passing behind the stomach in the wavy pattern right tortuously it is passing on the posterior side of the stomach and then it is supplying to your spleen right so this particular artery is given a name that is called as your splenic artery so this particular artery is your splenic artery this is your splenic artery splenic artery is giving out two branches one branch on the top is called a short gastric artery another branch is called as left gastroomental artery short gastric artery and left gastroomental artery Next, 
this uh, celiac trunk is also giving a branch that supplies to the lesser curvature of the stomach and this particular branch is called as left gastric artery this is called left gastric artery next important thing is that from this uh, splenic artery from the celiac trunk you have got a branch called as common hepatic artery this common hepatic artery is dividing into two one is called as hepatic artery proper okay hepatic artery proper and this branch is called as gastro duodenal artery because it is present between the stomach as well as the duodenum now from the hepatic artery proper you see a branch that is supplying to the lesser curvature this is called as right gastric artery so this branch over here is called right gastric artery from where it is emerging it is emerging from the hepatic artery proper okay it will also emerge from the common hepatic artery as well so this hepatic artery proper is further divided into two arteries one is called as a right hepatic artery another one is called as a left hepatic artery this right hepatic artery gives out a branch this is called as a cystic artery which supplies to your gallbladder this is your gallbladder okay now if you discuss about the gastro duodenal artery that is present between the duodenum as well as the stomach over here it is also giving us to two branches see one branch which uh, anastomoses with left gastro omental artery is called as right gastro omental artery the next branch is called as superior pancreato duodenal artery see this particular branch is called as superior pancreato duodenal artery so this is what i was telling you the right gastric artery is a branch of hepatic artery proper right and uh, least commonly it arises from the common hepatic artery which artery is involved if there is ulceration of first part of duodenum you know most commonly the duodenal ulcers are most common in compare with the gastric ulcers right so which part if if there is ulceration of the first part of the duodenum which artery is responsible for that that will be your gastro duodenal artery not responsible which artery is involved there okay gastro duodenal artery will be involved in case of ulceration out of all the arteries of the stomach especially the largest artery of the stomach is your left gastric artery left gastric artery is the largest artery of the stomach second important thing is that the first 2 cm of this duodenum you call it as a duodenal cap now this duodenal cap is supplied by four important structures what are these four important structures one is called as hepatic artery second is called as right gastric artery third is called as a gastro duodenal artery gastro duodenal artery and next one is called as a right gastro omental artery omental artery or epiploic artery see here this is called as right gastro omental artery you can also call this as epiploic artery right gastro epiploic artery left gastro epiploic artery left gastro omental artery so right gastro epiploic artery so these are some of the branches which we have to discuss in case of celiac trunk celiac trunk okay now after the celiac trunk is done the next important thing here we have to discuss is a superior and inferior mesenteric artery so this branch which is arising over here is called as a superior mesenteric artery and here we have got the inferior mesenteric artery and all of you know this important thing that uh, this part of the colon which is going up is called as a ascending colon and uh, this part of the colon which is descending down is called as a descending colon and this part is called as a middle colon middle part of your colon now ascending colon is located on the right side descending colon is located on the left side now what are the arteries over here if you can see one from the superior mesenteric you see an artery that is coming down like this now this is the artery that is supplying two important structures one is the colon here it is also supplying to the ileum this part is called as your ileum so it is supplying to the ileum and also initial part of the colon that is why you call this artery as ileocolic artery what is the name of the artery over here let me write it as artery number 1 artery number 1 is ileocolic artery okay so this is called as ileocolic artery now this ileocolic artery this ileocolic artery is having a branch that is completely surrounding your appendix right ileocolic artery is having a branch that is 
completely surrounding your appendix. Now this artery over here is called as appendicular artery. So a branch of iliocolic artery is called as appendicular artery. Okay, that is called as appendicular artery. Coming to the second important artery. This particular artery over here supplies to the right part of the colon. You see it is supplying to the right side of the colon that is your ascending colon, right? So if any artery is supplying to the right side of the colon, you call it as right colic artery. What is this artery called as? This is called as right colic artery. And third important thing is that you also see an artery that is going up and supplying to the middle part of the colon. This is called as middle colic artery. What is this called? This is called as middle colic artery. Now in the same way, if you look at the inferior mesenteric artery branches, see one branch here on the left side, right? It is supplying to the sigmoid colon. So that is why you call this particular artery as sigmoidal artery, sigmoidal artery. The second important branch is supplying to the left side of the colon, that is your descending colon. That is why you call it as left colic artery, left colic artery. And the third and the last important thing supplies to the rectum here. This is called as the rectal artery, which is also called a superior rectal artery. Superior rectal artery. Okay. So these are the branches which you see in case of superior and inferior mesenteric artery. Again, the topography is very important as I have already told you. Uh, superior mesenteric artery, lower border of L1. Next, this is a body of L3 and lower border of T2L is your celiac trunk. Now let us discuss about, now let us discuss about the branches of internal iliac artery. Now here identifying the branches in this picture might be little bit tricky and difficult, right? So let me uh, draw, I've drawn another picture over here. Now here you need to understand one thing that exactly at the level of L4, the iota is dividing into two arteries called as common iliac arteries. So this particular iota is dividing into two common iliac arteries. One is called as a right common iliac, another one is called as a left common iliac. So this is your iota dividing into right and left common iliac. Now, this common iliac is in turn dividing into two. One is called as internal iliac artery, another one is called as external iliac artery. What are the two? Internal iliac and external iliac. Now, internal iliac artery passes through what greater sciatic notch. So this one is called as greater sciatic notch so this artery passes through the greater sciatic notch and divides into two more arteries one is called as an anterior division another one is called as a posterior division now in the posterior division there are three branches you can remember by the mnemonic la c okay so what does l stands for l a stands for lateral sacral artery l a stands for lateral sacral artery s stands for superior gluteal artery superior gluteal artery and i stands for iliolumbar artery ilio lumbar artery so what are the three important arteries over here one is called as a lateral sac one is called as a lateral uh, sacral artery superior gluteal artery and iliolumbar artery now coming to the anterior division there are many other branches in the anterior division. Now, how do you remember all these branches which are located in the anterior division? You can remember by the mnemonic moving up. Okay. What is the mnemonic over here? You can remember by the mnemonic moving up. Moving up. Okay. What does M here stands for? M here stands for middle rectal artery. M here stands for middle rectal artery. O stands for obturator artery, obturator artery. V stands for the vaginal artery which is located in the females, vaginal artery which is mainly located in the females. I stands for uh, internal pudendal artery, internal pudendal artery, internal pudendal artery. Next here, next I stands for inferior gluteal artery, next I stands for inferior gluteal artery okay and remember one thing this inferior gluteal artery is one of the largest branch here this is the largest branch here okay next 
uh, I after I we have got the S S U P. Okay, after I there is no G, right? We have got directly there is G actually. If you can see here, uh, this is M O V I, right? There is no N actually. There is I and G. Okay, moving sub. What is S U P stands for? S U P stands for superior vesicular artery. Okay, superior vesicular artery. When there is superior vesicular there will also be inferior vesicular artery inferior vesicular artery and the last artery just to remember out of this mnemonic is uterine artery so these are the branches of the uh, iliac artery that is your internal iliac artery right now let us discuss uh, some of the questions that were mainly based on the contents so what are the contents that are located in the abdomen and all we shall discuss that so we shall discuss first of all uh, regarding the contents of the spermatic cord. So first here there is contents of the spermatic cord but I am telling you contents of the spermatic cord we shall discuss it later on. But now we shall discuss about the contents of the rectus sheath. Now when it comes to the contents of the rectus sheath you can look in this picture that this is your external oblique, internal oblique and transverse abdominalis muscle. So this external oblique is having an aponeurosis. This blue color lines are nothing but called as aponeurosis. Okay, so the first important thing is that this is external, what is this? External oblique aponeurosis and this muscle which is located here, RA and RA is rectus abdominis. You know, rectus abdominis we have got in the center on the right as well as on the left. External oblique here, internal oblique here and down here we have got the transverse abdominis. In each layer we have got each one. Now, what is uh, number two here? Number two is also called as anterior lamina of internal oblique muscle. Okay, so this is internal oblique muscle. And this internal oblique muscle has got this particular aponeurosis. This aponeurosis is dividing into two. This one is called as an anterior lamina. This is called as a posterior lamina. So this one is called as an anterior lamina of internal oblique aponeurosis. IOA, internal oblique aponeurosis. Next, what will be then four called as? This should be called as posterior lamina of internal oblique aponeurosis. This should be called as posterior lamina of internal oblique aponeurosis. And what is number three over here? Three is called as the aponeurosis again of which muscle? Transverse abdominalis. So transverse abdominis aponeurosis. This is transverse abdominis aponeurosis transverse abdominis aponeurosis and just beneath that we have got the fascia transversalis so here if you look at the structures so what is a rectus sheath over here rectus sheath is a sheath that is covering the rectus abdominis muscle you see this is your rectus abdominis muscle in front of the rectus abdominis muscle you have got two layers this is layer one layer two behind the rectus abdominis muscle you have got three layers this is called layer one layer two and layer three this picture looks as if they both, all these layers are separate to each other, but no, they are all attached to each other. Okay. So, anterior wall of rectus sheath. Anterior wall of rectus sheath is formed by two. What is that? External oblique aponeurosis and anterior lamina of internal oblique aponeurosis. Then what if, what if the, what is the posterior wall of rectus sheath formed by? Posterior wall of rectus sheath is formed by posterior lamina of internal oblique aponeurosis. See, this is your posterior lamina of internal oblique aponeurosis. Next, you have got the transverse abdominis aponeurosis. This is your transverse abdominis aponeurosis. And third one here is called as fascia transversalis. These three together, you see, posterior lamina here, transverse abdominis aponeurosis and fascia transversalis. These three together form the posterior wall of rectus sheath. So, the and now after discussing the walls, right now we shall discuss what are the contents but before that all this uh, walls whatever i have told you this is above the arcuate line okay this is the things which i have discussed above the arcuate line now let me discuss the uh, walls of the rectus sheath that is located below the arcuate line but remember one thing below the arcuate line usually you have got only one layer that is the anterior wall okay repeat now below the arcuate line what are the important things you can see so here you see below the arcuate line 
right external oblique internal oblique transverse abdominis is common and what are these these are the aponeurosis as usually so external oblique internal oblique and transverse abdominis all the three aponeurosis they join and form what which wall anterior wall or posterior wall they form the anterior wall okay then what is posterior wall formed by this particular thing is called as fascia transversalis no particular muscle over here there is fascia transversalis which forms the posterior wall okay and this forms the anterior wall so anterior wall is formed by external oblique internal oblique and transverse abdominis ka aponeurosis so posterior wall is formed by fascia transversalis so these are the layers that are surrounding the rectus abdominis when below the arcuate line here it was above the arcuate line okay now let us see as the topic itself is what are the contents of rectus sheath what are the different contents of rectus sheath within the rectus sheath you have got two muscles two vessels and two nerves two muscles in the sense what are the two muscles one is called as your rectus abdominis one is your rectus abdominis muscle and the other one is called as your pyramidalis muscle pyramidalis muscle rectus abdominis as well as your pyramidalis muscle coming to the vessels here epigastric vessels we have got one on the top one on the bottom on the top is called as superior epigastric vessel superior epigastric vessels and on the bottom is called as the inferior epigastric vessels superior epigastric vessels and inferior epigastric vessels two nerves we have got what are the two nerves one is called as thoraco abdominal nerve thoraco abdominal nerve right and the next important thing is a subcostal nerve subcostal nerve so in the discussion of in the thorax when i was discussing the intercostal nerves i told you we have got typical nerves atypical nerves right so these are the atypical nerves because they not only supply the intercostal space they even come out of the intercostal space so nerves from t7 to t11 right these are the atypical nerves and we have got other atypical nerves also subcostal nerve is t12 why because it is located below the last rib right La below the last rib you don't have any space you cannot call it as intercostal space right you have to call it as subcostal space so there we have got a nerve this is the one now if you look at this this is a female pelvis right so what i have done is that i have just put a half of the female pelvis onto the next picture over here okay so here if you see you know that this is your ovary this particular structure over here is your ovary now apart from this ovary let us see what are the important structures that are located ovary and this is called as your fallopian tube fallopian tube now let us discuss the other important structures for example the ligaments that are located in the female pelvis okay so the topic here would be the ligaments of female pelvis ligaments of female pelvis what will be the ligaments the first important ligament over here is called as the round ligament what is this this is called as the round ligament of the uterus round ligament of the uterus next down here you have got three important ligaments one is called as mesosalping see this particular one is called as mesosalping okay beneath that we have got mesovarium mesovarium mesosalping mesovarium and we have got the next one called as mesometrium mesometrium so three important things what are those three mesosalping mesovarium and mesomet all these three together you constitute the broad ligament very very important we shall also discuss what are the contents of the broad ligament so these three together you constitute the broad ligament okay next important thing this particular ligament over here is called as which is attached to the ovary is called suspensory ligament of the ovary this particular ligament of the uh, ovary over here is called as a suspensory ligament of the ovary okay suspensory ligament of the ovary okay the next important thing is the ovarian ligament over here this is your ovarian ligament this is called as your ovarian ligament now after this ovarian ligament this will be called as your ureter 
this is called as your ureter over here right and the next important thing is this is called as your cardinal ligament what is this this is called as your cardinal ligament where your uterine artery and uterine vein is present okay and this is your uterosacral ligament so these are some of the um, ligaments of uh, the female pelvis out of which the most important thing i want you to remember is this one that is a mesosalpinx mesovarium and mesometrium together you call it as what broad ligament right so let us see what are the contents of this particular broad ligament so how do you remember the contents of this broad ligament you can remember by the mnemonic forso okay forso not forzum it is forzo now f here stands for fallopian tubes f here stands for fallopian tubes over here okay now after this o here stands for ovaries o here stands for what ovaries and ovarian arteries ovarian arteries okay u here stands for uterine arteries uterine arteries and this content i have taken it from the science direct website okay so that is a standard website which we basically use so fallopian tubes ovarian arteries uterine arteries next r here stands for the round ligaments that is the round ligaments okay next uh, s stands for suspensory ligaments suspensory ligaments and finally we have got the ovarian ligament ovarian ligament so these are the structures that are forming the contents of the broad ligament okay these are the contents of the broad ligament now coming to the next important structure here that is called as your ischio rectal fossa so even if this picture is difficult let me draw another picture and show it to you what does this ischio rectal fossa exactly look like so you have to know that this particular structure which i'm drawing here is your rectum now after the rectum you have got this particular part here called as a anus okay so here this particular thing over here is called as a rectum okay and here you have got is your anus clear now now after this there is next important thing that is there is a muscle that you have to memorize them see here exactly near the anus here we have got a muscle this particular muscle is called as a external anal sphincter i will label these muscles later on this is called external anal sphincter after this you have got another muscle that is going up like this right so this particular muscle over here is called as levator ani muscle so one muscle is called as your external anal sphincter let me write it now itself this is called as your this is called as your external anal sphincter external anal sphincter and this one is called as your levator ani muscle this is called as your levator ani muscle okay after external anal sphincter and levator ani muscle you have got the next important muscle that is uh, present here like this this is called what is this muscle called as this is called as obturator internus muscle okay this particular muscle is called as obturator internus muscle obturator internus muscle okay now covering these muscles there should be fascia isn't it covering these muscles there should be fascia now if you see here from the external anal sphincter you see a fascia that is present all over the levator ani muscle like this this particular fascia is called as anal fascia what is this fascia called as anal fascia and next you see a fascia that is covering the obturator internus muscle and this fascia is called as the obturator fascia so there are two important fascias over here this particular fascia is called as the anal fascia and this particular fascia down over here is called as your obturator fascia one is anal fascia and another one is your obturator fascia next connecting both of them you have got another fascia in the form of a moon a moon shaped fascia like this this is called as your lunate fascia so how many fascias you have got you have got three important fascias one is called as the anal fascia covering the levator ani muscle obturator internus fascia right covering the obturator internus muscle and thirdly we have got the lunate fascia so these are the three important fascias so let us see here this particular fascia is called as obturator internus fascia obturator internus fascia 
and this particular fascia over here is called as anal fascia anal fascia and this one over here is called as a lunate fascia this is called as a lunate fascia over here right now next important thing there is a fascia right there is a fascia that is touching both of them so what is the fascia here you see there is a fascia that is present here and this is present perpendicularly to the remaining muscles so this fascia is called as perineal fascia what is this this particular fascia over here is called as perineal fascia this is called as your perineal fascia and obviously this is your skin over here this is the skin over here now here very important thing is that you can see three important spaces right so if you clearly observe see this is one very important space potential space this is the second important potential space and this is the third important potential space so the first space is called as supra tegmental space so let me write it down here one two and three the first one over here is called as supra tegmental space the first one over here is called as a supra tegmental space second one over here is called as ischio rectal fossa this is our topic now that is a ischio rectal fossa second one is called as ischio rectal fossa we are going to discuss about the borders also okay ischio rectal fossa and third one over here is called as perianal space perianal space perianal space so these are the three important things which you need to know now remember one thing that this ischio rectal fossa whatever is there area number 2 this is com containing completely fatty tissue and it is almost yellow in color okay it is complain completely containing the fatty tissue which is completely yellow in color it looks completely yellow if you look you tell me the borders now if you look here laterally what do we have obturator internus covered with obturator fascia so laterally what do we have here we have got obturator internus muscle covered with the obturator fascia okay so it means you are telling that this is the lateral side yes this is the lateral side and this is the medial side okay laterally what do we have have obturator internus fascia and obturator internus muscle okay then medially what do i have medially i have got uh, a levator anni muscle with anal fascia okay and external anal sphincter see here medially what do i have external anal sphincter is there i have also got anal fascia like this i have also got this muscle called as levator anni muscle okay so all these three important muscles are located over here you see all these three important muscles are located over here right so this these muscles are located where medially next apex apex and base apex what do i have there is fusion of anal fascia and obturator fascia see here this is the apex apex is a fusion of both this is the anal fascia this is the obturator fascia both of them are fusing at the apex here and finally we have got the base base is having the skin and the superficial fascia so here the base is having what the skin as well as the superficial fascia right so all these are the borders of ischio and ischio rectal fossa now let us concentrate on the contents so how do you remember the contents of ischio rectal fossa very easy thing that is remember the mnemonic lips l i p s lips l stands for lymphatics l stands for lymphatics i stands for internal pudendal artery vein as well as nerve internal pudendal artery vein and nerve i also stands for inferior rectal artery inferior not internal it is inferior rectal artery vein and nerve okay next fourth important thing here is lip p stands for what p stands for posterior scrotal vessels and nerves posterior scrotal vessels and nerves okay next p here stands for perianal branch of s4 perianal branch of s4 and the sixth one is a subcutaneous fat and again these uh, subcutaneous these contents have taken it from the website called as 
uh, research gate okay that is a very very standard website so from there i have taken these six important points so remember by the mnemonic lips okay right the next important thing is what are the sites of esophageal constriction first important thing you need to know that the length of the esophagus is roughly around 25 centimeters and it ranges all the way from c6 till t11 so there are actually four important constrictions which you can see one is called as a cricopharyngeal constriction which is located at the level of c6 arch of aorta is located at the level of t4 to t5 left principal uh, bronchus that is located at the level of t5 to t6 and right crust is located at the level of t10 okay this is where it makes a opening within the diaphragm now from the incisor teeth how much is the distance it is around 6 inches for the first constriction second constriction is around 9 inches third is 11 and the last one is a 15 inches so this is a simple thing which you need to remember coming to let us discuss the differences that are present between small intestine and large intestine okay so i think these differences all of you might have known this you have been studying from your uh, um, school uh, school age onwards right even your 10th uh, plus 1 and plus 2 also you have got this thing that is small intestine as well as the large intestine right so coming to the small intestine how much is small intestine in length the length of the small intestine the first important point the length of the small intestine is around 6 to 7 meters 6 to 7 meters in length if you look at the length of the large intestine it is around 180 centimeters in length 180 centimeters in length second important thing if you look at the diameter the diameter of small intestine is small the diameter of large intestine is large so the diameter over here is small and here the diameter is large third important thing that within the small intestine if you look at the layers we have got different layers right mucosa submucosa we have got the muscle layer and finally serous or adventitia so mucosa here is having villi and crypts what is mucosa having mucosa is having both villi and crypts okay villi and crypts but here mucosa is having crypts but no villi so here mucosa is having crypts it is not having villi it is not having any kind of villi fourth important thing i hope all of you know what are panet cells right so here we have got panet cells small intestine we have got panet cells panet cells are present but here there are no panet cells panet cells are absent now coming to the globlet cells more number of globlet cells are present in the large intestine and here we have got decreased amount of goblet cells where here we have got many number of goblet cells okay sixth important sixth important thing is that you know we have got some glands called as Peyer's patches and Brunner's glands so where are Brunner's glands usually located they are located in the duodenum and where are these Peyer's patches located they are located in the ileum so Brunner's glands Brunner's glands are usually located in the duodenum whereas Peyer's patches are located in the ileum are located in the ileum but when it comes to the large intestine both of them are absent okay both of them are absent the last important thing is regarding the tinea so do we have tinea over here no there is no tinea but here we have got the tinea so these are the important differences which you need to know between the uh, small intestine as well as the large intestine okay so the important points over here are one is you need to know the length right and you also need to know uh, that here there is no villi coming to the penet cells this is another important thing coming to the globlet cells and regarding the Brunner's glands as well as the Peyer's patches also you have to know next important thing which you need to understand over here is this particular picture over here that is your anal canal and within this anal canal if you see there are uh, dentate margins here tooth like margins so these tooth like margins over here are called as the dentate line 
so above the dentate line the epithelium the the blood vessels the veins everything are different the lymph nodes are different below the dentate line also the structures are different so let us see let us see above the dentate line uh anal canal is having what kind of epithelium blood vessels and all and below the dentate line what do we have we will discuss so anal canal above dentate line above the dentate line and anal canal below the dentate line so above and below the dentate line above the dentate line we have got a thing called as endodermal tissue so the tissue it is completely endodermal in origin endodermal origin okay but whereas below the dentate line it is ectodermal origin ectodermal origin okay next what is the epithelium that is located above the dentate line anal canal is made up of cuboidal epithelium cuboidal epithelium whereas here it is stratified epithelium stratified epithelium third important third important thing is that what is the artery that is supplying above the dentate line superior rectal artery the artery is superior rectal artery then here if it is superior the opposite will be inferior so here it is inferior rectal artery coming to the fourth important thing here we have got superior rectal vein superior rectal vein so if there is superior rectal vein the vein here will be inferior rectal vein inferior rectal vein uh fourth right so the fifth important thing here is that what kind of uh, uh, lymph nodes we have got here internal iliac group of lymph nodes so the lymph nodes over here are internal iliac group of lymph nodes okay now when it comes here what kind of uh, lymph nodes we have got here superficial inguinal group of lymph nodes superficial inguinal group of lymph nodes we have got two types of lymph nodes here we have got internal iliac here we have got superficial inguinal now look at the most important thing that is regarding the pain and this area above is pain insensitive whereas the below the dentate line is very very much pain sensitive this is pain insensitive pain insensitive and this is pain sensitive pain sensitive pain sensitive pain insensitive as well as a pain sensitive region okay so here uh, direct inguinal hernia right you have to see that this direct inguinal hernia this usually develops medial to the inferior epigastric vessels and when it comes to the indirect inguinal hernia so it develops lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels so i was already telling you what is the difference between direct and indirect if the abdominal wall contents are directly protruding through the superficial inguinal ring that is direct if they are first protruding through the deep then superficial it is indirect and in direct it will lie medial to the inferior epigastric and in the indirect the hernia lies lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels so here you can see that this is your anterior superior iliac spine and uh, this particular part over here is called as your pubic tubercle okay so first of all this part is called as a pubic crest pubic crest now after that you have got this as a pubic tubercle pubic crest as well as the pubic tubercle and above that this line over here you see here this is called as a pectineal line this is called as a pectineal line right so pubic uh, uh, tubercle as well as anterior superior iliac spine in between that so all the way from the anterior superior iliac spine till the pubic tubercle you see a structure that is attached here this is what is called as your inguinal ligament okay now here if you see see this entire structure over here is called as your inguinal ligament now a uh, few important things you need to know that how is this inguinal ligament formed inguinal ligament is formed by the folding of the aponeurosis of external oblique muscle so this is a external oblique muscle and down to it this is the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle this aponeurosis what has happened it has folded down like this you see 
it has folded down and continuously it has formed a canal here this is ligament here this is called as inguinal ligament it is formed by the infolding of external oblique muscle okay so uh, within this 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 particular center line is called as linea alba over here what is this this is called as linea alba now if you look at this inguinal ligament here some fibers of inguinal ligament are arching backwards like this right arching backwards onto where onto the pectineal line this is your pectineal line right so they are arching backwards onto the pectineal line like this so these ligaments over here are called as a lacunar ligament what is this particular ligament over here this particular ligament over here is called as lacunar ligament okay now some of the fibers of this lacunar ligament are laterally arching back and they are resting down on this pectineal line right so on the pectineal line the fibers of the lacunar ligament are resting down here so this is called as a pectineal ligament this is called as a pectineal ligament now next important thing you need to understand over here what is this important thing that uh, this is your lacunar ligament and this is your pectineal line over here right the next important thing is that here if you see uh, from the lower anterior inferiorly right so this part is anterior inferior part of the inguinal ligament in the anterior inferior part some of the fibers are projecting medially upwards you see some of the fibers are going medially upwards right actually if you see here uh, let me draw these fibers these fibers are actually crossing the midline what is the midline by the way midline here is called as linea alba linea alba is the midline so these fibers are projecting anterior medially and they are crossing upwards i mean they are crossing the mid uh, the midline right so these fibers which are going upward medially and crossing the midline which is also called as the linea alba is called as a reflected part of inguinal ligament okay what is this called this is called as a reflected part of inguinal ligament what is this this is the reflected part of the inguinal ligament now this external oblique muscle right this external oblique muscle the aponeurosis this is the aponeurosis the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle anterior inferiorly anterior inferiorly it is having a small defect let us say you take a paper make a hole right so that hole is called as a defect so in the same way this entire muscle in a simple terms to tell that this entire muscle is having a small hole down here that is called as a defect and that defect which you see here is called as a ring that ring is superficial inguinal ring so that is your superficial inguinal ring so what is that ring called as that ring is called as your superficial inguinal ring so what are the things we have discussed over here one is called as a lacunar ligament next we have discussed is a pectineal line and after that we have discussed is the uh, uh, this one the reflected part of the inguinal ligament and next we have discussed a superficial inguinal ring okay so these are the things now if you look at the superficial inguinal ring which i have drawn it over here this superficial inguinal ring is having two crusts so this is called as the medial crust and this is called as the lateral crust of the inguinal ligament superficial inguinal ring lateral crust so here there are two rings superficial inguinal ring and deep inguinal if i ask you superficial inguinal ring is formed by it is a defect in the aponeurosis of external oblique muscle what is it it is a defect in the aponeurosis of what of external oblique muscle okay where is this located this is located antero inferiorly antero inferiorly okay then what is this deep inguinal ring deep inguinal ring is a defect in the transversalis fascia that is a defect in transversalis fascia okay defect in the transversalis fascia so what is transversalis fascia again see in the inguinal region down there in the inguinal region if you see the outermost layer will be skin okay so after the skin the next layer will be superficial fascia superficial fascia 
okay after this superficial fissure the next layer will be external oblique muscle and what did i tell you this external oblique muscle anterior inferior it is having a small defect and this is called as superficial inguinal ring this is called as superficial inguinal ring okay now after that we have got internal oblique muscle okay after internal oblique we have got the next layer called as transverse abdominis transverse abdominis and the last layer of the transverse abdominis is transverse alveolus fascia transverse alveolus fascia okay this transverse alveolus fascia whatever is there if there is a defect within this this forms the deep inguinal ring so i hope you understood superficial inguinal ring is formed by external oblique muscle and deep inguinal ring is formed by the transverse alveolus fascia okay now if you can see over here uh, where is your superficial inguinal ring see this is your superficial inguinal ring okay below that what is the layer you have got you have got internal oblique below that what layer you have got you have got transverse abdominis below that what layer you have got you have got transverse alveolus fascia if there is a defect in transverse alveolus fascia that is called deep inguinal ring so this is your deep inguinal ring now this looks that both of them are in the same plane i cannot show you here in a 2d image that one is on the top one is on the bottom right actually superficial inguinal ring is here deep inguinal ring is down here. okay now in between both of them this particular uh, uh, canal which you can see over here this is called as inguinal canal what is this canal this is called inguinal canal now for uh, better more understanding uh, let me uh, draw this part and you will clearly understand what i'm trying to explain you okay so let me draw it over here just a rough picture okay so what was the thing i told you this is your skin after the skin what did i tell you after the skin the next layer is superficial fascia okay see this is your superficial fascia after that a muscle you have got what is that muscle external oblique see this is your external oblique muscle and external oblique is having aponeurosis see this is the aponeurosis of external oblique and aponeurosis of external oblique is having a defect like this this defect is called as superficial inguinal ring after that what is the next muscle you have got you have got the uh, what is this this is called as your yes this particular one is called as your uh, internal oblique muscle after internal oblique muscle what is the next muscle you have got this is called as a transverse abdominis muscle after transverse abdominis you have got a transverse fascia so this is transverse alveolus fascia this transverse alveolus fascia is having a defect again this is called as deep inguinal ring so connecting both of them you have got a canal like this you see this canal is called as inguinal canal okay this is what i am trying to show it to you here anatomical purpose where is the deep inguinal ring located the deep inguinal ring is located exactly above the mid inguinal point you see this is the mid point of the inguinal ligament exactly about that above that you have got this particular deep inguinal deep inguinal ring this is called as deep inguinal ring and this particular thing over here all the way from superficial to the deep this is called as your inguinal canal what is this this is called as your inguinal canal and inguinal canal is how many centimeters inguinal canal is around 4 centimeters okay so where is this inguinal canal inguinal canal is located above the inguinal ligament exactly speaking inguinal canal is located about the medial half of the above what medial half of the inguinal ligament okay and where is your superficial inguinal ring so this is your superficial inguinal ring superficial inguinal ring now within this inguinal canal what do we have in the males within this inguinal canal we have got what spermatic cord and ilio inguinal nerve we have got spermatic cord and ilio inguinal nerve next in the females what do we have again we have got ilio inguinal nerve ilio inguinal nerve along with that we have got the round ligament of the uterus 
round ligament of the uterus these are the two important things that are located next important thing is that uh, as we are discussing about each layer skin external uh, the superficial face external oblique internal oblique and all so and next transverse abdominis and all so we shall see each layer how is this layer in relation with this uh, deep inguinal ring okay for example which you can see this particular muscle which you can see over here is called transverse abdominalis muscle this is called as transverse abdominalis muscle transverse abdominalis muscle now in this transverse abdominalis muscle from where this transverse abdominalis muscle is originating from the inguinal ligament exactly speaking from the lateral one third of the inguinal ligament see here from the lateral one third of the inguinal ligament and next the fibers are coming up like this now some of the fibers what is happening is that they are arching downwards and they are forming a tendon like thing which is attached to the pectineal line here this is the pubic crest it is attached to the pubic crest now this is called as your conjoint tendon okay this is called as conjoint tendon and there are some fibers that are arching downwards right and they are covering this uh, medial region you see this blue color region which i have highlighted is the medial region of the deep inguinal ring these fibers are called as interfoveolar fibers so what is this particular tendon here this is called as conjoint tendon okay and this particular one over here is called as a what is this this is called as interfoveolar fibers inter interfoveolar fibers okay now coming to internal oblique internal oblique originates from the lateral one third of the lateral two third of the inguinal ligament you see lateral two third of the inguinal ligament and it is also forming what a conjoint tendon very important thing okay now so transverse abdominis uh, arises from the lateral one third right the fibers arch downwards and form the conjoint tendon clear the next important thing which you need to know over here this muscle in the center is called as your rectus abdominalis muscle rectus abdominalis muscle okay and this is your anterior superior iliac spine now next important thing here is that i've told you this is called as your pectineal um, ligament you see this particular ligament in the black is green is pectineal ligament so here if i'm drawing a ring over here i'm telling you that this ring is a femoral ring so if i ask you what are the borders of femoral ring what will you tell a is anterior p is posterior l is lateral over here m is medial anteriorly what do you have over here yes anteriorly what do you have over here anteriorly you have got inguinal ligament you see anteriorly on the top you have got your inguinal ligament okay medially what do you have medially you have got this ligament called as lacunar ligament lacunar ligament okay next uh, posteriorly what do you have down down you have got pectineal ligament pectineal ligament and laterally what do you have you have got see laterally what do you have got you have got this particular vein over here this is called as external iliac vein what is this this is called external iliac vein above this external iliac vein you have got this artery called as external iliac artery okay external iliac artery so this is external iliac vein external iliac vein apart from this uh, after the femoral ring we have to discuss there is one very important triangle over here you can see there is a triangle like this this triangle is having three borders medial border inferior border as well as lateral border now if you look at the medial border medial border is formed by what the rectus abdominalis so these two are the lateral borders of rectus abdominalis so it is formed by the lateral border of rectus abdominalis lateral border of rectus abdominalis muscle okay inferiorly what do you have got you have got the inferior uh, inferiorly what do you have got the medial half of the inguinal ligament see from here till here is the medial half of the inguinal ligament so inferiorly you have got the medial half of the inguinal ligament inguinal ligament and this is this is uh, medially right so this is me inferiorly inferiorly we have got the middle half of the inguinal ligament now when it comes to laterally laterally what do you have got inferior epigastric artery now where is this inferior epigastric see this particular artery over here is called inferior epigastric artery 
and inferior epigastric artery is arising from where it is arising from the external iliac artery so literally we have got the inferior epigastric artery inferior epigastric artery so these three important things together are forming a triangle this triangle is called as inguinal triangle or hesselbach's triangle what is this triangle over here this is called as inguinal triangle inguinal triangle or you can call it as Hesselbach's triangle, inguinal triangle or Hesselbach's triangle. Okay, this is one of the very important thing you need to know. So if we go down here, you can see very clearly that here we have got uh, the deep inguinal ring and this is the superficial inguinal ring. Right? Now there are two types of hernias, you know. One is called as direct hernia, another one is called as indirect hernia. Now what is happening in direct hernia? Direct hernia is the contents of the intestine. So these are the contents of the intestine right they are protruding through the superficial inguinal ring you see the contents of the intestine are protruding through the superficial inguinal ring and so you call it as a direct inguinal hernia what do you mean by indirect inguinal hernia these contents first enter the deep inguinal ring and from there they enter into the the superficial inguinal ring so that is why you call it as indirect hernia so there are two different types of hernia First, if the hernia passes through uh, leaving the deep inguinal ring, if it is passing through the superficial inguinal ring, you see this is deep, this is superficial. If the contents are passing through the superficial leaving the deep, that is called as your direct hernia. And here in the indirect hernia, first it passes through the deep inguinal ring and then it passes through the superficial inguinal ring. Okay, so these are some of the important things which you need to know. Now, apart from this, if you look here, this is the spermatic cord. So, if you look at the layers over here, we have got the external spermatic fascia, which is a continuation of external oblique muscle. Cremastic fascia, continuation of internal oblique. And internal spermatic fascia, continuation of the transversalis fascia. How do you remember this? You remember this like this. T turns into eyes. T is transversalis fascia. I, tie, tie turns into eyes. I stands for internal oblique. E stands for external oblique. They all turn into eyes. I stands for internal spermatic, cremastric and external spermatic. Okay. So, these are the important things. Now, next important thing you need to know here. What is this? That here you have got uh, the center part is you have got the testicular artery. Surrounding that you have got a venous plexus called as pampeniform plexus. And below that you have got the remnant of processus vaginalis. So, these are the structures in the labelings which you can just study it only. So, spermatic cord right there are three important things there are three arteries three nerves and three other structures three arteries are one is uh, you have got the testicular artery ductus deferens artery and cremastic artery next important thing is uh, what are the three nerves that are located here genital branch of genitofemoral nerve cremastic nerve and sympathetic nerve fibers what are the three other structures over here ductus deferens, pampeniform plexus and lymphatic vessels. These are the three important structures that are located over here. Right. So this completes the discussion of the abdominal pelvis. So thank you so much for watching my video. Goodbye.